What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Good Theology Podcast. My name is Jake. I'm here with my co-host, David Campbell. Thank you for joining us. Hope you are all doing so, so well. Yeah, if you didn't catch last week's episode, or maybe it was two weeks ago, I can't remember. Time is a blur. We announced a really cool, exciting product called Pulpit AI. No, it won't help you write your sermon. It's not for that. So before you criticize, let me just answer that question off the bat. But it is an amazing product that will help all of our fellow podcast creators and even preachers out there in terms of helping create supporting content and collateral for uh, what you put so much work into creating your sermon, your podcast, all of that. So check that out. And uh, yeah, it's good to be here. David, how are you? Good, thank you. Always good to be together. You and I uh, have been kind of going through this Nancy Piercy book, Love Thy Body, uh, we took a couple weeks or a few weeks off of that, uh, mostly because of me. My schedule has just been a bit erratic, busy, busier maybe than normal. But we're back at it today. We're looking at chapter four of this book. Can you do us a favor and give us a bit of a summary as to the thesis of the book and how that's going to then tie into today's topic? Yeah, she's um, looking at some of the trends in postmodern culture, uh, one of which is the separation of the physical body from the undefined other part of us, uh, which uh, has given rise to what's called personhood theory, which is a modern invention. And personhood theory kind of takes us away. It's really, in in my opinion, you know, pe when people develop uh, a new point of view, there's often a, a motive behind it. It's mm. not uh, a startling intellectual discovery, you know, after thousands of years that someone has just discovered Come how up to- Come with something brand new. Person, what a, who a person is. It actually, I think, is a cover for justifying abortion. And so the idea is, and this goes back to 50, 50 years ago, from the time that abortion was being made legal in many countries, that- a baby isn't a person, that an unborn baby isn't a person, and therefore uh, uh, the murder or killing of that unborn child is justifiable because it's not a person. So the problem is, of course, people who advocate this view have never been able to agree on, well, then who is a person? Uh, what constitutes a person? Does someone become a person when they're born? Or uh, at a later date, and at its extremity, um, some of the people advocated that you, uh, for the viewpoint that you weren't really a person until you were came of age, and so you could kill children. And I mean, by the grace of God, thankfully, no one was allowed to sort of carry that out. But it's a very dangerous uh, concept, and but it, where it has proven lethal, apart from abortion is in the area of euthanasia, because if you define a person as someone who has certain cognitive, say, a certain level of cognitive ability, then those who are, you know, severely disabled, perhaps, or uh, developmentally handicapped, uh, or uh, suffering from dementia, um, are no longer persons. And, you know, the con that concept didn't come out of nowhere. It was uh, the eugenics movement, which flourished un under Hitler um, and uh, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, her lineage, uh, she was drinking from the same well as the Nazis did, very much so. And, and at the same time, the 1920s and 30s, her viewpoint and those associated with her were, you know, let's kill off the disabled. And of course, Hitler just extended it to the Jewish people. So we have no idea today, you know, the horrendous history of this or the absolutely uh, awful roots of the Planned Parenthood movement. That's where it comes from. It's kind of hushed up, but it really is anyone with any ounce of historical ability, you know, can uncover the facts and what she wrote and is on record and so on. And so, uh, and so it's, this is, this is, you know, become popular. Um, this sort of personhood theory has become popular. And so, you know, when new ideas are introduced, they sometimes have 
effects, consequences, unintended consequences or unforeseen consequences. And one of the unforeseen consequences is the tendency we have to separate ourselves as persons from our physical bodies. Um, and there, it, there's an enormous contradiction, self-contradiction in this whole way of thinking, which is, is very prevalent in our society because most of these people are what we call materialists. They're atheists. They're materialists. They believe that, you know, all there is, is matter. And, and yet they've defined personhood as something above, above and beyond mere matter. Their philosophy, their understanding, their philosophical approach, um, does not allow them any means of defining what a person would be as uh, considered separately from the molecules that make them up physically. And so what is a person? Uh, it, 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 you, you know, we who are Christians, we are theists, we have uh, the, an understanding as biblical believers that we're made in the image of God, and that's where we derive our pers personhood from. And that personhood includes body, soul, and spirit, where the Bible views us as people as integrated, and it views us in a holistic way. We can't divide us into different parts. It's all, all part and parcel, the same reality. Um, but uh, we're not so, uh, although we have a body, the body does not express the entirety of who we are. Um, we have a spirit that God has uh, instilled within us, and we're made in his image. So for, for Christians are therefore able to hold actually a high view of the physical body because God has created us in his image, and the Bible tells us that God will restore us in his image through the resurrection of the body. So the Bible places a very high value on that, which is why Christians have a very high view of sexuality. The problem with the materialist view and the personhood view is that when you kind of look down upon the material part of us uh, as being uh, of little consequence, uh, then it really doesn't matter what you do with your physical body. And so... This is the theme, this is a very long-winded way that you set me up for it, uh, to get around to what Nancy Piercy is trying to point out, uh, which is the practical consequences of this. Uh, and this particular chapter deals with what she calls schizoid sex. Um, so the idea that um, sexual contact is a purely physiological thing, um, it and it actually should be kept separate from who we are in our personhood. So uh, it's a very low view of the body and of sexuality. It, it means that it doesn't really matter what you do with your body. Um, and actually, it's preferable that you keep the rest of you, whatever the rest of you is, separate from that so that you're not, and it's a protection against being hurt or whatever, and uh, also gives you license to do what you want uh, sexually, and denies the fact that God created us, male and female, and she'll get onto this in a, the next chapter. Um, we were our bodies were designed with a purpose, and the purpose was the procreation of children uh, and the continuation of the human race. Um, and of course, uh, there's all sorts of other other things that go along with that in terms of sexuality. But um, once you uh, separate that, then you know we look at society today and we find out well why is it that young people are not able to date? They have no concept of personal interaction with other young people. Um, they have sexual encounters, but uh, They've been taught just to keep it at a physical level and don't get involved. But God created us to be involved in the release of chemicals and in, in sexual intercourse um, opens us to being connected 
at a, in a holistic way with the person that we're involved with. Mm-hmm. We're denying that. And so we do get hurt anyway. We know we've got no way of, of dealing with that. And uh, so we withdraw. And of course, coincidentally, the presence of pornography, the availability of pornography, uh, which has come along at the same time in its electronic form, means that um, you don't have to have physical sex anymore. And uh, particularly among men who are the primary you know, consumers of pornography, um, it's preferable to uh, to settle for images. Be untangled with the emotional well, state that comes with sexual intercourse. With the real person. And that's the mess, colossal mess, that we're living in. And in the midst of it, Christians are kind of uh, given a, a bad uh, uh, review because supposedly we have this prudish, terrible view of sexuality, but actually Christians have a very high view of sexuality. Uh, and, uh, you know, because we believe that the body is created by God and also that it cannot be separated from the personal commitment of two people to one another, mm-hmm. which it doesn't take too much common sense to figure out that's going to produce a much more satisfying uh, and long-lasting um, relationship than the hookup culture. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a brilliant summary of her thought thus far, and then even on into this uh, chapter four about um, hookup culture, which, as you pointed out, she entitles schizoid sex. And you know, I'm interested in in the fact that uh, you started by talking about the topic of abortion and how we come up with certain things like personhood theory to justify the killing of unborn babies. But our conclusions, they don't stay put in one category, do they? They always move on over into all the other areas of our life as well. And so the thinker that she points out, I think a couple of times in this chapter is Descartes. It's a, the, the Cartesian way of answering the question of essentially what am I? And, and you know, most people are familiar with Descartes, um, his his slogan, I, I think, therefore I am. So humans are fundamentally thinking beings. That then speaks into the, the personhood theory uh, in the sense of we are not just, not even just primarily, but almost almost like we are solely the upstairs version of ourselves. We are our uh, we are our immaterial self, and the body is just a machine that uh, that the ghost inhabits and steers. But we can do with the body whatever we want because it's inconsequential. And so I can then apply that to how I treat an unborn child, uh, or I can apply it to what do I want my sexual behavior to be like? Because at the end of the day, it's not it's not a big deal what I what I do with the body. Um, but as you pointed out, uh, that turns out not to be true at all. And one of the things that Nancy Piercy talks about in this chapter are the chemicals that get released during sex. And I think uh, for women, the, the chemical is called oxytocin, and uh, that is the same chemical that gets released in a woman when she's nursing her child. So they call it an attachment hormone. Uh, and for men, I think it's, I'm going to butcher this, but it's like vesopressin or something like that somewhere along those lines. And uh, I think she says scientists have dubbed that the monogamy molecule in the sense that we were, uh, at least we give the appearance of being designed for attachment, being designed for actual intimate relationship that involves sex, not just hooking up uh, with different sexual partners because it has no consequence. Um, And certainly when you... uh, when you ca- combine that with a low view of children, removing the naturally occurring consequence of sex, which is children through various different ways, adds to the, the fact that we, we think sex is something so inconsequential because we've even made it acceptable to discard what the naturally occurring consequence physically of sex is, which is children through abortion. And we are lying to ourselves about the, the other consequence, which is uh, it wrecks us emotionally. And we would say spiritually uh, to treat sex in the way that we do in our in our culture. I guess that would be my summary based upon your summary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And, and of course, not only, you know, what goes around comes around and people, particularly in modernity, or e even in our current, you know, sort of postmodern expression of thinking, uh, have this incredibly arrogant idea that they invented all these new ways of thinking. No one else ever thought of anything like it, which is absolutely rubbish. Every single part of, of postmodernism and critical theory is hijacked from somewhere else and put together like some Frankenstein, which it is. Um, but the, the underlying uh, idea of uh, a, a person versus the, you know, the sort of, we'll call it, we could call it the soul versus the body, if you want to put it that way, or the immaterial part of us as opposed to the bodily part, it was right back to Plato and uh, his idea that uh, that reality consists in completely immaterial uh, forms. Actually, he called them forms. And he never quite got to the bottom of they sounded, sometimes they sounded like an intellectual concept. Sometimes he verged on the idea that maybe there w was some kind of divinity behind it. Uh, he never quite reconciled how those ideas related to the Greek gods, but it's thought that he probably didn't have a very high view of the Greek gods, but was afraid to admit it because he might get, you know, um, murdered like his teacher Socrates did. But in any event, uh, Plato uh, had no problem uh, participating in and endorsing pedophilia uh, at the same time as he was promoting the idea of the good in, and um, holding philosophical discussions in terms of what is the good and what are the virtues and what is the best, most virtuous way of living and so on, while... Uh, you know, in the some of the dialogues in Plato, you know, references are made to the boys that they were having sex with and were probably present. Uh, of course, nobody knows with the dialogues of Plato, he's, you know, is he making them up? Did they actually happen or whatever? But definitely that sort of thing was going on in his circle. And, and so, uh, so his idea was that it really doesn't matter what you do with the body. Um, that's kind of divorced from the idea of the good, uh, be, and and uh, true reality is found in the realm of the immaterial. What what is it that? Could we just pause it really quick? Because this is a theme from Plato to the Gnostics to the materialists the to the the Gnostics yeah. were warmed over later generation Platonists, followers right. of Plato with right. with you know elaborations yeah. changes and then you even have some hist some some heresy in the in the early church in terms of denying the the actual bodily reality of jesus because there's just no way that uh the divine would take on human flesh because human flesh Which is so exactly the same source because all that thinking that uh that flowed from plato and his followers was very prevalent in uh greek-speaking culture right through until the early centuries of, of the church. Why is our answer keep coming back to devaluing of the physical and the denigration of the physical realm? Is it because we don't have another, is it because we, apart from Genesis chapter three, do we not have an adequate reasoning and response for why the physical is so corrupted? Well, I, I mean, I honestly do think that, uh, you know, in, in the 1960s and with the with Foucault and the um, original uh, postmodern philosophers, they were part of that sort of complete overturning of traditional moral values. And, uh, you know, sex was almost a religion. I mean, it was it was um, itself kind of schizophrenic because on the one hand, you know, you do anything you want with your body doesn't matter. But on the other hand, uh, the fact that you could do anything, uh, you know, you the physical pleasure that you got from it was almost like a religious experience because they didn't have any other religion. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
Uh, so that's so it you, there. It's like we want to escape without without the transcendent. We want to invent the transcendent. Well, you you've got to find it somewhere, right. and you've got to find meaning somewhere, and uh, and so um, and then of course the birth control pill comes along, and you can have sex without producing children, uh, and so that really lights a fire under all of this. But then because there is an adequate contraception around uh you you have the explosion of the abortion movement and uh that that's where um you know some of the the you know the the people that were trying to justify that from an intellectual point of view um they they had a a deep well to draw from that goes right back to plato which says that the body doesn't really make any difference and uh and uh, and so, uh, what does make difference is, you know, you've got some. It's it's your your ability to think and reason. And uh, I mean that that's Plato. That's pure Plato. Um, and so a baby can't do that. An unborn child certainly can't do that. And maybe even a young child can't do it. And elderly people who have got dementia can't do it. And maybe some disabled or handicapped people can't do it. So throw them out with the rubbish because they're not real people. See, you can trace the line of thinking all the way back to Greek paganism. And one of my, you know, I wrote this book called Exodus, and one of my uh, main points in it is that uh, there's no vacuum, uh, that something will fill a vacuum. And the, the biblical revolution in the early centuries of the church uh, was to replace that Platonic way of thinking, that Greek way of thinking, with a biblical way of thinking, uh, and uh, and invest eternal value in people, which is why the church, as Nancy Piercy points out in her book, uh, elevated the status of women, elevated the institution of marriage, um, uh, was uh, um, a leading force in in getting rid of slavery. And treating slaves properly in the Roman Empire, and you know, uh, picking up abandoned children, this kind of thing, it's because of what they believed, uh, and because they didn't believe that pagan way of thinking. Well, if the biblical way of thinking starts to diminish in society, that's where the vacuum comes in. You know, there isn't a vacuum; it will be filled by something else. Her and. What comes in is is actually just what was there before. And, okay, so but why is that? Why why is it the vacuum always gets filled with with uh, devaluing physical with de- devaluing material things, the physical world, including our our human bodies, and not making more of them? Like, what is it about when we delete God from our consciousness? If I could say that. Why, why is it always bringing about the same thing? Like without God, why is it always the denigration of the body and not the 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 valuing of it? Because, well, for the simple reason that it's only in the Bible that you find the idea of God creating the physical body, creating the human human being, uh, male and female, of equal value, uh, and holistic. Oh, good body, soul, and spirit are all part and parcel of the same entity that's created in the image of God. That's a uniquely biblical perspective. You won't find it anywhere else. And it was powerful enough that in the early centuries of the church, it managed uh, substantially to displace the pagan ways of thinking that had been there beforehand. But my thesis is they've just come back again. What was there beforehand has just come back again. You can call it critical theory, social justice, intersectionality, or whatever. But really, at its heart, it's it's a platonic way of looking at life. Then, uh, with a little window dressing of um, Hegel, who was a German philosopher, and Karl Marx and Charles Darwin, both of whom developed uh, he- Hegel's philosophical thinking and applied it in different directions. And uh, so it was the Darwinists that were behind. The eugenics movement and kill off the the um, you know the disabled and 
the elderly. That was the Darwinists because of survival of the fittest. You know, you 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 know the if 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 you weren't fit, uh, then you just deserve to be killed off. And of course, that fitted in with the German philosopher Nietzsche, who was the you know in, who believed that might was right. And then, hey presto, you have not Nazism. And so all these things are are floating around. Uh, when you start to weaken the biblical foundations of a culture. And so it's a really bleak world that we live in, which is dominated by this way of thinking. And people don't realize just how bad it is and the consequences that it's having, you know, the, the devastating toll that it's taking on, um, on people, especially younger people. A question I've been thinking about lately is how how do we get a world that is still living in the afterglow of christianity to understand that uh even whatever remnants of of what they consider to be you know right and wrong are uh are the the outcome of christian influence how do you how do you get them to to see the natural trajectory of where we're headed? It's like it's because they think that the thing they think that their own moral judgments are a result of their own reasoning, their own their own ability to determine what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong, without realizing that their minds are still somewhat formed by uh the christian atmosphere which they have absorbed whether they've realized it or not in the west it's like how do you wake people up to go like you wouldn't you wouldn't think this way if not for the influence of christianity and the more you remove christianity from culture like the more scary the more the more dangerous the world you're living in is going to become for yourself and for the people that you love. Yeah, I mean, we're living on borrowed credit uh, as a society, and um, it's starting to fall apart. Like, okay, so here's, uh, I was looking just actually this morning, I was going through our, uh, not our Good Theology Instagram, but the Vast Podcast one that posted a clip from, uh, from our Good Theology podcast. Uh, and the clip was us talking about how, um, the concept of human rights is a, a direct um, uh, result of the influence of Christianity. Um, and this person commented, said, not really. Human rights are more based upon enlightenment principles, not on Christian ethics. Otherwise, human rights would have been established in the late Roman Empire. This isn't the case. If anything, human rights depended upon a secular thinking that attempted to leave church Christianity and metaphysics behind. So they're saying, no, that the church has had no influence upon the existence of human rights. That's actually a result of enlightenment. And before the enlightenment, there was no such thing as human rights. Well, you know, they obviously don't understand anything about uh, the hi history of the, you know, early church period, those first few centuries where, um, Christians uh, were the driving force in establishing. You know, Rome was a, and, and the Roman Empire was a horrendous place to be if you weren't one of the elite. Mm -hmm. And it was the church that changed all of that. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the first great fruit of the Enlightenment was the French Revolution, where everyone murdered each other. So I'm not really too impressed with that idea. No, and and then as we move on in Enlightenment history, we come to uh, Hitler, and then we come to Lenin, and well, I'm not the exact chronological chronological order. We come to the Bolsheviks and Lenin, then to Hitler, then to Stalin, then to Chairman Mao. That's great Enlightenment thinking, uh, you know, because that's all a result of. Marx, who was a student of Hegel, who was, you know, part of the Enlightenment. And so I'm not sure that I follow this line of thinking at all. I think that in the Enlightenment has led to 
uh, more death, destruction, and slaughter uh, than anything that ever existed before, uh, and raising it by uh, the power of you know two or three or something probably. Um, I guess like so, the core, the core tenet of the Enlightenment being what that human reason by itself is enough to know truth. That you 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 can exclude the idea of God, and we can come up with uh, what is right and what is wrong on our own initiative. But you see, um, um, on the basis of what? Well, that's the problem. That, but uh, what what people also don't realize is that a lot of these early thinkers. I mean, you quoted Descartes. Uh, they were professing Christians. You know, they weren't, a lot of them weren't trying right. to, you know, they weren't trying to promote atheism. Uh, they were caught up in a, you know, philosophical kind of spiral, uh, trying to figure out the meaning of life and so on. Um, but they weren't, they weren't, I mean, some of them were trying to prove the existence of God. They weren't trying to deny it. And that goes for many of the main thinkers in the Enlightenment. Uh, I think that would include uh, Kant and uh, uh, Bishop Barclay uh, and possibly even David Hume, who wasn't no, necessarily he was an prove that he wasn't necessarily trying to prove that God didn't exist. Um, I think I think he was an atheist outright. Um, I could be wrong about that. Exist, uh, but a lot of those. But you know, so that that is that is um, a kind of a ridiculous statement, um, and it's very a, a historical. And um, also, you know, when you look around the world, uh, you look at uh, you know most. Educational institutions were established by Christians. Most hospitals uh, were established by Christians, uh, and so uh, the, because and and in the history of early science, particularly, um, most of the early scientists were devout believers. And the reason their scientific progress progressed was that because their faith in in biblical revelation gave them the conviction that God had ordered the cosmos in such a way that it could be understood. Right. And that's what, that's what empowered them and has provided the foundations for modern science. So, uh, but you know, the, if the ultimate end of the Enlightenment is critical theory, then we're in a mess because everybody's fighting against everybody else, even in that little world. Uh, and, and it's vicious. We've just come from England where, um, one prominent, uh, feminist professor was, uh, has just been hounded viciously and, and her free speech is they've tried to eliminate her, you know, because she's, you know, promoting, um, feminism as opposed to, the transgender agenda, and of course, with Jake, people like J.K. Rowling. Her name's Kathleen Stock, by the way. And uh, there's a big hoo-ha at Oxford University over that. So you know, it's uh, uh, it's just become very, very nasty. Uh, and and the rights, human rights. Speaking about human rights, it's everybody is out for what they can get at somebody else's expense. That's where what we've come to. That's where the Enlightenment has led us. There's not a concept of love your neighbor. That only comes from God because human nature does not have the capacity for uh, unconditional love. Uh, we are going to put ourselves first. And that's Enlightenment thinking. I think the fact is we live in an increasingly nasty world. And I don't think the Enlightenment has, has done very much to help it. Right, the opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, Nancy Piercy says something I think really insightful in this chapter. She says that hookup culture is unraveling the social fabric. It produces isolated, alienated adults who come together temporarily for physiological release, but repeatedly, uh, sorry, by repeatedly breaking up or never connecting in the first place, many people fail to learn how to form 
the strong, resilient bonds needed to create happy, fulfilling, long-term marriages and families. So her, her point being that because we view sex the way that we do as just a uh, something that we participate in physically, that is having a, a deeper effect on us socially um, to the point that it's it's preventing us from forming the kinds of bonds like a husband and a wife who have children and have families that make up a society. And so if we keep going down this road, we will not have a society anymore. And I would say uh, we open up ourselves to greater tyranny because we, we no longer have that pre-political bonded relationship with the family where we are just atoms who fall into the might makes right thing. And therefore we concede more and more of our rights to a governing body who then has to come in and, and determine how society functions and who gets what and why. So without strong families, you will wind up with tyranny. It see, that see, to me seems like an inevitable outcome. The more individualistic we are, not just in our attitude, but in our actual bonds, the, the more, uh, the, the bigger government has to become in order to manage a society full of atomic beings. Yeah, yeah. because the sense of cohesion and mutual commitment uh, becomes less and less and less, uh, and the foundations begin to fall apart. Well, it's true. It's a, it's a frightening uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like Aldous Huxley's book *Brave New World*. I read that for the first time maybe a couple summers ago. The the story is frighteningly accurate. I mean, you have this society full of people who are who are pleasurably satisfied pretty well all the time. They take. I think it's, it's like this this drug that they take that that keeps them pleasured, you know. And as long as that that part of their being is satisfied, it allows the government to control them. And and so the the real I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but if I were, um I I would say that it is it is in those who have power's best interest to promote the sexual revolution and to celebrate the satisfaction of all of our sexual desires as being good because if that part of us is satisfied and we we are just these individuals who are about our own personal satisfaction the more our social fabric tears apart and the more we open ourselves up to be manipulated and controlled you know lots of unintended consequences is that that would be the non-conspiracy theorist <laughs> <laughs> way of saying it <laughs> yeah it's uh it's fascinating stuff and, and but you're right about that we don't think about where the trains we board head and then we arrive at destinations that we we uh we have to figure out how to manage staying there because it, it feeds our selfish nature nature in certain ways that we don't want to give up and so we f we try to figure out how can we keep this how can I keep gratifying my sexual desires that I have or whatever the the example is um, and and learn to manage the unintended consequences that come along with that um, until eventually we we can't manage them. One of the persons she talks about in this chapter is Freud. And so I think um, it'd be worth finishing up our discussion by bringing him into the conversation as we just have a couple minutes left. I guess he essentially sees us as sexual beings. If Descartes would say, I think, therefore I am, um, maybe Freud would say something along the lines of, I have sexual appetite and therefore I am. I, I, I don't know if that's a, 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 an accurate characterization or not, but probably fall somewhere along those lines. Um, and therefore, our, the, our most important aim in life is satisfying our, our sexual desires. You know, that does seem to be something that is pervasive throughout the hookup culture, and it, it gives us reason to use people because by doing that we're meeting our most basic need utterly selfish and and it it's an expression of might versus right because whoever has the most power uh is going to be able to get their desires met <laughs> and the weak and the vulnerable will be used which is how slavery worked in the roman empire where the slaves were abused sexually because they were considered just property 
uh, and un, until, of course, the church, um, you know, even though it didn't have the benefit of the Enlightenment, the church managed to um, actually uh, take the biblical concept of human rights, which has existed since the days of Moses, and uh, you know, bring about a revolution in, in the entire culture, a good revolution. Uh, but now we're back at this. I mean, if everybody... So, um, my spiritual father used to say to me, the problem with marriage is that, you know, that if if both partners come into it with a straw to suck out of each other's cup, pretty soon both cups are dry, instead of which we should stick our straw into God and his resources and start giving to each other. And then, of course, uh, it works wonderfully. Um, but uh, if we are just in this to have our own needs met, uh, it, and in Freud's case, and a, you know, a lot of what we see around us, it seems to boil down to sexual appetite. Then, really, y y it's a justification mm -hmm. to use people whatever way you want because you don't really see people as anything other than a body which supplies you with uh, sexual pleasure. They're not a person, you know, for your to to whom commit your life and walk in covenant till death do us part, that's not part of it. And then por pornography comes in and you don't even need a person. You mm -hmm. can just do it online. Mm -hmm. And and But people it, are still it, used, obviously, in the process. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, as she points out in this chapter, um, as soon as the tech allows for it, uh, it will be really lifelike versions of... of sex dolls like that that is where it's going to go it's it's going to be sex with robots without question let's and why don't you give us a 60s go ahead. there's the enlightenment for you that's where it's got us in response to the comment that was written in sex with robots <laughs> that's where the enlightenment has got us uh, how does that work for you in terms of being uh, let's um let's conclude with a 60 second vision of of uh, biblical vision of sex. Why don't you paint us the picture? Well, Nancy points out, you know, she talks about the Hebrew word yada, which means to know, uh, and it means including to know in a sexual sense, but that's not its primary or deepest meaning. Its deepest meaning is to know God. And uh, so in knowing God, uh, being created in the image of God, we have the capacity to, to know each other and um that is the basis on which marriage is founded that we recognize that both parties are made in the image of god that our knowledge of one another is based on our primary knowledge of god and our knowledge of god tells us to treat the other person um by means of what the Bible describes as covenant or covenantal lifestyle, to lay our life down, to walk in faithfulness uh, till death do us part. And that then becomes the foundation of family. And that then becomes the means by which society, a healthy society exists and, is, and survives into the generations to come. Mm -hmm. I remember too, that uh, John C. Clarke and, and Mar Marcus Peter Johnson pointed out in their book on the incarnation of God, that part of how we image God's triune nature is through man and woman and the the procreation of children, so that every person is most fundamentally a tripersonal being um, in, in terms of their relationship. They, they come from a mom and a dad. We all do, whether or not our relationship is good with our parents is another matter, but we are tripersonal people. And part of God making Adam and Eve in his image was them being fruitful. And that maps onto us, um, to use that, that theological word, interpenetration of the Trinity. We, we see that map onto the family unit um, in the earliest pages of, of scripture. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's an inescapable part of our fabric, part of what it means to be human, um, is to have a high view of sex 
a high view of marriage between a man and a woman, a high view of children, um, and how God knew what he was doing when it came to what would be the building block of a healthy society. That concludes our time for today, chapter four for Nancy Piercy's book, Love Thy Body. And we'll pick it up again next week is the plan. David, thank you so much for your time.